Hi, my name is Phil Moeller. I'm a contributing editor at U.S. News and World Report and a co-author of U.S. News' ebook last year called How to Live to 100. For today's Google Hangout, we have some of the experts who participated in this book, and we'll be talking with them today about their thoughts of things that people can do that affect their happiness and perhaps their longevity as well. We have three guests with us today. They are Tony Antonucci, who is a professor of psychology and senior research scientist at the Institute for Social Research at the University of Michigan. Laura Karstensen, who is a professor of psychology and director of the Stanford Center on Longevity in Palo Alto. And Deborah Umberson, who is a professor of sociology at the University of Texas at Austin, where she specializes in the physical and psychological health aspects of gender and relationships. My first question is for Tony. In terms of longevity and happiness, and this is a big question, are there some clear behavioral do's and don'ts that you want to share with people today? Well, I think one thing is people should plan on living to 100. That gives them a long-term perspective. Mm -hmm. The second two, I'd say three things. Plan on living to 100, optimize the positive, do the things that make you happy, and a new thing that I'd like to concentrate on more and more as I get older and older is take the negative out of your life. People mm. who drive you crazy, get rid of them. People who, if you owe, people who you can't get rid of, they're there. Try not to let them make you crazy. Don't highlight the negative in your relationships. Highlight the positive. I would say make your life a, 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 a no negativity zone where you emphasize the positive, you create the positive, and you minimize the negative. And feel as though you can control what happens to your life. Mm. You know, many older Americans are clearly not prepared financially for retirement, and a good number of them are probably going to have to continue working past their traditional retirement years. Um, talk about this trend a bit and tell me how it intersects with happiness and some advice you might have for people who are in this situation. Mm -hmm. uh, Americans work really hard. Uh, we probably are working more hours uh, than uh, workers in any other developed country and so a lot of people when they consider the prospect of working even longer are not happy about it. Uh, but it, it, it appears that uh, work is, is good for people. It doesn't have to be paid, but paid or unpaid, being engaged in the world, getting out of the house, having something to do that matters for other people actually benefits mental health. There's some recent evidence that there are also some cognitive benefits of, of working longer, that the work environment provides stimulation uh, and is good for cognitive processing and cognitive aging. Uh, so the, the news is not all bad, even though it's not necessarily what people um, were, were planning on and what they hope for. So Tony, if my cognitive processing is better as I get older, is that consistent with getting rid of the negative or not? <laughs> well, it's interesting. Sometimes people use a lot of cognitive processing to create the negative, and I think it can keep you alert, but not positive. So I think you we're better off using those cognitive energies to process the positive. Really folk optimize the positive, minimize the negative. With the people that are close to you, because those people you often can't get rid of, that's not a nice term, but you can't, you can't kind of divorce your kids, right? If they're driving you crazy, you have to find a way. And I tell people to come up with some pat reactions like, thank you for sharing. Instead of saying, that's an obnoxious thing you just said to me, you just sort of cut off the conversation. On the other side, do the things that you really enjoy, and that will keep you cognitively engaged as well. Great, great. Um, our next question is for Deborah um, in terms of uh, her area of specialization. And um, just yesterday in front of the Supreme Court this week had been just fascinating oral arguments about same-sex relationships. And so clearly they are really way up there on the national agenda today and obviously on a lot of state agendas as well. Deborah, can you talk to us a little bit about these relationships and, and especially how what appears to be a growing acceptance of same-sex relationships affects the happiness of people involved in these in these pairings. Sure. Uh, well, you know, 
close intimate relationships are really important to the well-being of of every American and the grow the growing significance of um, our growing acceptance of same-sex couples and especially same-sex marriage I think is profoundly important to the well-being not just of those same-sex couples but also their family members and their children um, first for couples growing acceptance means less discrimination and stress in their daily lives but it also means more support and affirmation from the people around them, the people they work with, medical professionals they have to deal with, and from their friends and relatives. Uh, but of course the growing acceptance of same-sex couples and marriage is particularly beneficial to the well-being of their children. Mm -hmm. uh, and you refer to those Supreme Court arguments, uh, Justice Kennedy said earlier this week those children want their parents to have full recognition and full status full status of their parents would mean greater stability and well-being not just for the couples but for their children too so growing acceptance of same-sex couples has these huge ripple effects on well-being that goes beyond couples to uh, affect the people around them as well great um, Laura uh, there's even some evidence that uh, for, for economic advantages of marriage uh, married couples can take more financial risks so they can uh, pursue an education, uh, they can compensate for times when one person is out of work, so there are actually benefits for the broader society uh, when, when marriage is, is widespread. You know, I have one sort of final question for everybody uh, if you want to weigh in, and Tony, I'll, I'll sort of ask it of you first. Um, is happiness improving as the economy gets better and as our, um, you know, people unemployment rate goes down and people are maybe feeling a little bit better about themselves? Is it that simple a relationship? Well, I would say no. I, I, it's, uh, it's harder to be happy when you're flat out poor, but being rich does not make you happy. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of complex situation. I think that the economic downturn that we've been living through has been a very difficult time, and especially for people at the lower ends, but also people who make comparative judgments about themselves. For young people who are coming out, got a great education, can't find a job, this is not going to create a happy moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wouldn't say it's just, I wouldn't say it's just about economy, although I wouldn't say economic factors are unimportant. Sure, sure. Laura? Uh, uh, the more we learn about happiness, uh, the more we learn uh, about people's ability to adjust and adapt to circumstances. Uh, happiness research has shown us that there are not the big differences that we would have thought across um, income levels and uh, by country and by what would appear to be advantages and disadvantages. As Tony was saying, it's not just about the economy. If anything, the research on happiness shows us that people can be happy in a variety of circumstances and that they, they come to uh, uh, adjust and respond. I mean, imagine you're in a foxhole and you just dodged a bullet. You're really happy there for a second. You know, it doesn't <laughs> doesn't mean that the circumstances are optimal. Um, uh, the overall satisfaction people have with life tends to be more of a cognitive assessment and that gets to be, uh, is affected more by the general circumstances in a life. But people rebound with, with, with happiness and accept at the most severe um, and, and low levels of poverty, um, we don't see much of a difference by by um, income level and, and happiness doesn't mean we shouldn't care it probably means that index is not the index that should make us feel good about a particular group or bad about a particular group. sure sure Deborah do you have any closing things you want to share with us today well I yes I guess I would like to share one thing not to be a bummer <laughs> but uh, I guess as a sociologist I really do feel like it's important to point out that even though we we can control what we feel somewhat internally it does matter what situations we're in mm. so when we're in more under more stressful conditions and less supportive conditions uh, it takes a toll on us and it's a lasting toll so it's a good reason for not just individuals to try to improve their happiness and well-being but for us to provide the infrastructure to improve happiness and well-being like that yeah. Great, yeah, great. Well, listen, we're going to have to ring off now. Um, 
it was so great of you to make the time to join us today. Um, I believe it actually was a lot of fun. Uh, I'm happier. <laughs> Glad to hear it. Thank you very much.